I started the residency with the RCC in the, the Glebe House, um, I kind of knew initially that I would be treating both exhibitions as, as separate things, one responding to the Derek Hill collection and then responding kind of to the National Collection, um, uh, working with the Arts Council. I think like the incredible thing about the Derek Hill collection is that unlike let's say a, an academic collection of works or whatever it might be, there's no single threaded narrative that you can kind of pin down on, on, on Hill's collection of work. Instead, you know what it kind of represents, because Hill in some senses was like a magpie collector, where he collected things based on what he found visually interesting, things that perhaps represent relationships with family, relationships with friends, and uh, relationships with other artists. And in that way, um, it kind of left it really open in, in terms of the potential ways that you could respond to the collection. In terms of the artists that um, have been selected uh, to respond to the whole collection, there's um, time-based artists, uh, Emer and Kat McClay, um, and video artist Myra Carton. The great thing about the works that are presented in the house is that, in a sense, they kind of represent a contemporary response to the, to the themes that Hill would have been looking, looking at himself. Those of relationships, themes of religion, and, and kind of examining how contemporary practices are approaching themes that still have relevance today. And I think that's one of the really important things that was key for me whenever I was putting the, the works in the collection was bringing back an awareness that the works that are in this collection, even though it is a permanent collection and in some ways a static collection, it still has relevance to people now. So starting off with Emer and Kat's work, um, kind of the, the collection of works that are gathered here in the house belong to um, a work called A Body is a Body is a Body, but it's been reconfigured um, and reassembled in the house in different rooms, uh, depending on maybe the way it draws relationships to other works that Hill would have collected in the space, or indeed just works that seem to make sense according to the flow through the house. So the works that the Maclays make Every visual that you see, if you like, is sculpted meticulously by the Maclays digitally in an app called Blender. And so there's a huge level of craftsmanship still present in the work, um, but it just gives evidence, I suppose, of a more contemporary approach, um, approach to sculpting methods, if you like. The first piece that we see here, Tiffany Lamp, uh, the Tiffany Lampshade, um, it seemed important in this space because for visitors as they go through the house it serves as something of an announcement of that time being brought back into the space as well as that it draws parallels to the kind of objects that Hill would have collected himself so the Tiffany lampshade um, in the in the dining room space we actually see a Tiffany lampshade and so the Maclays broach the topic of faith in relation to queerness and personal identity but they do it through a decorative lens and so in that sense it follows Hill's collecting habits where he was interested in these things as decorative concerns. Throughout the house we also see these kind of crucifix forms um, placed at different locations either as markers for different encounters with the Maclay's work or as interruptions to places where existing religious iconography exists. And that's one of the important things in the Maclay's work is that they use the decorative device of the object um, as a way to interrupt the kind of the authority of the traditional object. So basically introducing symbols maybe of myth or magic into traditional objects as a way of just interrupting some of their power. And then the final Maclay piece just as we enter the house is this shrine image. And again the shrine is still taken from one of the animated works by the Maclays. And in the work we see what seems like a very personal private space loaded with traditional religious objects but also with reference to kind of an intrusion. And one of the important things about just having 
this image in this space is just to encourage, I suppose, a wee bit of awareness on the part of the visitors to the houses to think, how are we intruding into Hill's private space? What is our relationship with his private space? How much is known and how much isn't known? Moving into the dining room, um, I mean, some of the things that really registered in me in the room um, were images like the works by Lanzier. So, for example, the dying pheasant and then some of the images that we see over here as well. And when thinking how to situate works, Myrick Carton's Fox Cry piece seemed to be an appropriate choice just based on the work that's here. So in the work, we see the artist herself, Myrid, um, on a back road beside Prucklish Fish Farm. And she's, she's lying on the, gro the ground. She's licking on the ground, and so it has an object quality. Um, but she's dressed in this fake fox fur, um, which as Myrid describes, would have been the kind of outfit she would have wore when she was going out um, to nightclubs when she was younger. And essentially what Myrid is examining here is notions of what's natural and how those notions can kind of impact on, on uh, power relations between the sexes. So as Myrid describes it, the reason that she was in this outfit is this is an outfit she would have worn when she was going to nightclubs. After the nightclub, she would have been exposed to the elements and it created this kind of reliance on the guys that could drive and confirmed notions of masculinity and femininity, I suppose. And in that sense, the outfit serves as something as, as of, a, of a costume. Merit's physical act of making contact with the ground, that visceral kind of reaction and the, the reaction that you have as a viewer to see in that, and that discomfort is in itself a form of taken back power. Key in the piece, I suppose, is, is Prucklish Fish Farm itself. Um, we see the kind of artificial strobe lights which are themselves devices to limit the sexual maturity of, of the fish that are there um, because by limiting the, the sexual maturity that a fish can reach, they become more commercially valuable. And so in that sense, it's just examining our notions of the real and the unreal um, and uh, kind of challenging us to consider the ideas that we have about what we consider to be natural. Similarly, with other objects in the room, like Dying Pheasant by Edwin Lanzier. I mean, that itself captures an animal in suspended agony. Um, and by the same token, we see the stuffed hummingbirds, hummingbirds caught in suspended animation. And they seem to draw some kind of parallel to that suspended agony that, uh, that Merritt was examining in the work herself. And similarly, the audio that comes from the Fox Cry piece, the actual mating call of a fox that's often associated with the, the cry of a banshee. I mean, that sound in that space reframes our relationship with a lot of the works. And I suppose in that sense, it asks us just to question our own notions of the artificial versus the real and how we perceive those things. Myrid, when discussing her work, um, has said that in some way, a lot of her work functions as self-portraiture. Self-portraiture through relationships, self-portraiture through the landscape. And she said this beautiful thing where it examines the connections and boundaries between the self and the other. Um, and in addition to that, she said her work interrogates the struggle for intimacy and the ways that were compromised by our pasts, exploring the universal desire to be known and hidden and the costs invited, involved in both of these complicated commitments. With the still image work, that we see presented here, a lot of which is from an upcoming um, feature film by Myrid called No Place Like Home. We get examinations of personal space, of personal relationships and, and Myrid's relationship with the Donegal context. But a lot of these works question just how much can be known and how much we know and how much we conceal in these relationships. Um, so I think this is probably my favourite room of the entire house and that's because it's probably very real and that's probably where the real conversations have taken place. We've been to the dining room and that's where all the formal conversations would have taken place but here I think people relaxed. They sat around the kitchen table, they had a cup of tea and of course Gracie. Now Gracie was the true power behind Derek Hill. 
she kept him fed and watered and got him to places on time. And so she was the real power behind him. And so I think she would have sat here and I suppose the open door and Eddie would have come in and he would have carried all the stories from the community and they would have sat and they would have known people from this high right up. And everybody's always said about Gracie that they always felt better having spoken with Gracie. She's one of those people who had a really kind heart. I can probably see that from Derek Hill's portraits. Those eyes, they're almost dancing with life. So I really do think this is where it all would have happened. This is where people would have relaxed, had the cup of tea and had, you know, the real conversations. So just following on from what Jean said, I think that was one of the most exciting things about placing Merid's um, split channel work, the divide turn in this room. So the work comprises of two videos, the portrait of the craftsman and then the landscape of Baltinia. And both of those works, if you like, examine personal relationships to Merid um, or the nature of relationships. One of the great things about having these works in this space, similarly to how the Maclay's work brings a sense of time back into the house as you enter the house, um, these works bring a sense of conversation back in. Um, and so it's just a nice thing audibly when you're walking through the house and to actually hear in conversation coming from this space again, much in the same way that Jean described. So both of the works have digging, I suppose, as a central theme. In this piece, Landscape of Baltinia, it's the physical act of digging um, that serves as his anchor, whereas in the Portrait of the Craftsman, it's much more a conversational kind of digging. In these works, again, particularly in Landscape of Baltinia, there's the conversation about one's relationship with physical space, but also in the nature of relationships and how we kind of cause us to, to morph and merge. Hill's relationships with the Tory Island painters, as well as obviously giving evidence of Hill's incredible kind of generosity and desire for the arts to be more widely accessible. The relationships that he would have shared with the Tory Island painters would have been some of the most important relationships to him as well. Chiefly because, I suppose, as well as Hill being an influence for the Tory Island painters, so in turn did the work produced and the process of making work by the Tory, Tory Island painters influence Hill himself. With this work by Carton, Portrait of the Craftsman, it essentially serves as an examination of the artist's relationship with an artist. Now in the piece we also see the challenge of truth. It's a projected latex screen with the artist performing the actions of an actor who himself is performing the dialogue of the artist that had originally been interviewed. And it kind of portrays essentially what's a breakdown in a relationship, in a conversation. And what Carton explores in this work is how much of this kind of line of questioning of this interview between um, subject and uh, viewer, how much does that reveal about the person asking the questions and how much does it reveal about the person being questioned? And I suppose in a similar way, although in a more problematic way, um, so too, like Hill was influenced by the Tory Island painters, Carton is asking here, at what point does the interest or idealization or influence of another artist become possession? And I suppose just generally, it opens up questions about the nature of our relationships with others. One of the amazing opportunities about the residency is that it offered the opportunity to showcase young practicing artists making works that kind of trade in similar themes or in a similar stock to the types of work that Hill would have collected. But as well as that, it's just an amazing platform to have a collection as prestigious as the Hill House collection and to kind of showcase the works of younger artists emerging artists or indeed established artists and to see how their work both complements and complicates Hill's work in interesting ways. So moving upstairs, coming into the more intimate suite of rooms, um, this is actually where Hill would have displayed 
most of the religious iconography that he would have collected. The interesting thing about the collection of works is that it doesn't, the works don't belong to any single faith. Um, we see traditional Christian, Russian Orthodox, Christian imagery, Islamic art. And so that all seems to suggest that it was much more a decorative concern for Hull when he was collecting the re religious objects rather than something that was chiefly about his own faith. As such, it seemed to make sense that this would be the place that the Maclays would feature most prominently. So a body is a body is a body is a time-based work that uses experimental writing techniques and 3D tableaus of religious objects and strikes of elemental weather, um, accompanied by the overlay of, of words in the image. The work itself is an exploration of the historically fraught relationship between queerness and faith. Throughout the space, traditional religious objects, as we've talked about already, are inter interrupted by the more decorative works, again, decorative works like the type that Hill would have collected, um, that are loaded with magical and mythical symbolism. And as I've said, that was a, that's a technique of undermining kind of the authority that the traditional object would have. And a lot of the works we see references to bodily incursions, whether that be a knife, also the use of abject imagery, which um, Carton similarly used in the Fox Cry piece. And the mix between the kind of beautiful decorative object and the more uncomfortable, fleshy imagery, if you like, I suppose is a way or a technique of making us, the viewer, ask not only what is our own relationship with faith and how does faith potentially intrude into how we see others or see ourselves, but it also just asks us to think about people's, other people's relationships with their faith. And even if faith is a source of comfort for us and brings joy in our own life, it's also important to be aware of the potential difficulties that it might present for others. So in terms of the three-dimensional objects of the Maclays that are presented throughout the house, so the different crucifix forms are firstly meticulously sculpted in blender and then 3D PLA printed. Most of the objects um, are using like a coloured silk PLA, whereas with this particular one, um, we see resin being used as the base for the 3D print. The piece, A Body is a Body is a Body by the Maclays, would traditionally be seen as one single video in ordinary gallery settings. But obviously the way that viewers encounter the house is always through a tour. Um, and so because the work comprises of collage elements, uh, through conversations with the Maclays, we were kind of happy to break the piece up and actually have it function as kind of three separate stations, if you like, of the work. Encountered this way, it can, means they can be encountered out of sequence, but also it just means that from a practical viewpoint, the works can be encountered and enjoyed in their own terms rather than being rushed through as you go through the space. So by being broken up into the different stations, it means that the works can be encountered out of sequence. And the value, I suppose, of that is that because there is the relationship between text and image, it offers viewers and visitors the chance to get up close to the work um, and, I suppose, encounter the work properly um, in a way that doesn't feel rushed, but also just gives them the physical space they need to be able to see the work as well. Similarly to Carton's work, it was important that these kind of ambient soundscapes, natural soundscapes that are produced by the Maclays, once again, they kind of reframe a relationship with the spaces that we're in. And particularly now with Hill's bedroom, this seems to be the room that has the most religious iconography. Um, and again, that kind of artificial intrusion of natural sound just asks us to examine our own relationships with what we consider to be natural. So like the entrance to the house, as well as the time-based works and the crucifix forms, there also is the still image work that the Maclays have captured from their animated tableaus um, to kind of function within the house as well. So once again, the images have this kind of decorative beauty to them and they are nice objects to look at formally. But as well as that, like the video of a body is a body is a body, they make 
reference to bodily harm and relationship to the kind of more decorative, beautiful elements. Well, this is the final um, room in the house and the painting that always gets everybody's attention is this painting here as the painting by the English artist John Bratby as the painting of his wife and her name was Jean but the painting is called Jean in Bed with Jaundice so you can see from um, poor Jean she really has suffered from jaundice with a nice yellow hue to her face and they've even moved the bed down from the bedroom into the kitchen so around Jean you'll see everyday clutter but you'll also see bowls of oranges and jugs of water, which was a prescribed treatment for jaundice in those days, I think. But, you know, Jean didn't like the painting. And I don't think she liked her husband that much either, because she used this painting as evidence of neglect in a divorce case against her husband, John. And she brought the painting into court and said to the judge that this is a typical example of the neglect that I have suffered. Now, poor Jean thought maybe that he should be painting her when she looked well, um, and this is the only portrait he painted off her to make matters worse. But Derek Hill told me that not only did she go on to win the divorce case, which caused a major scandal, but he thought that she'd on to be a much, much better artist than her husband, John. So I think there's a moral in the story there somewhere. So in the final work, Miriam by Myred Carton, uh, we see an intimate filmic portrait of Myred's mother and her uncle, Danny. And the work considers the complex relationship between trauma, mental illness and different states of being. So the piece gently asks us to consider um, the unreliability of memory, if you like. Presented here in this space, the work is deliberately supposed to, supposed to evoke um, a relationship with the Bratby painting that Jean just discussed. Like the Bratby painting, I suppose in some ways this functions as like a social realist work or a contemporary form of social realist work in a sense particularly with the filmic portrait of Myred's uncle, Danny. Um, the lens is very real and honest, and I suppose it creates that kind of trust with the visitor whenever they come to view the work. In contrast, the parts of conversation that Myred had with her own mother, um, they are actually presented with Myred acting her mother's dialogue. And there's kind of a deliberate misstep or lack of sync between Myred's mouth movements and her mother's dialogue and that is supposed to move the conversation beyond the particularities of one person so this conversation doesn't belong just to one set of people and instead it makes the themes that are being explored more universal and more accessible where anybody can kind of access the conversation. Um, and I suppose if there's one thing that this intervention would seek to do more generally it's to ask us to consider our relationship with the objects that Hill's collected in the house, not just as particularities of Hill's interests or particularities of Hill's relationships, but rather as opportunities to open up conversation where we can all kind of engage with the themes and works that Hill would have collected over the years. Mm -hmm.